Welcome to Quaker Disorientation, session four, learning and unlearning Quaker faith and practice. In these sessions, I will be offering introductions to Quaker faith and practice, and also an exploration of ways our Quaker practice and history can sometimes get in the way of us manifesting the spiritual potential of the faith. We will be inquiring how to root down into the center of Quaker faith and practice and bring a sense of freshness and lean into the Quaker concept of continuing revelation to stoke the fire of a refreshed and continually renewing Quaker faith. In this session, I will be focused on exploring the testimonies of friends, how we express our faith in the world. Early friends were often disruptive disruptors of other church services offering unwelcome ministry that they felt arose from their sense of God. Let us see how we can offer that revolutionary fervor to ourselves, to our own practice, to disorient ourselves into a deeper faith. In the session, we'll be covering the testimonies, how they are fruits of the spirit, and how these communal commitments animate our faith and guide the way we show up in the world. Testimonies, fruits of the spirit. Testimonies are collective expressions of what friends have come to understand together as ways to live our faith. They are ways we express what we have understood inwardly and collectively discerned as core elements of how to express outwardly our faith. As friend Paul Buckley says, they have five attributes. A testimony comes from God, arises from an inward sensing and understanding from the spirit. It is an outward expression of a collective spiritual experience. Testimonies testify. They are not private, individual understandings or practices we live in our private lives, but ways we show up in the world. A testimony is communal. We might each hold a testimony in our lives, a way that we have discerned to live personally, but a testimony is collectively discerned and held, grappled with in community as a collective expression of our spiritual revelations and understandings. A testimony is challenging. It's usually not comfortable or conforming with the norms of regular society. It customarily calls us to act in ways that can marginalize us or put us at odds with regular society. At times, living a Quaker testimony has resulted in deep marginalization and sometimes persecution. A testimony is rooted in love. It's not an expression of righteousness, but leads us into deeper love of others. This can also be deeply nonconformist, such as really working for racial justice, which won't necessarily make others comfortable and can lead a person to take positions that may confront others or normalized polite racism. The intention of testimonies is to walk in the world in alignment with a deep spiritual knowing, to manifest the spiritual understanding that each of us has discovered with the added depth of the collective testimonies arising from a community sensing of the spirit. Michael Burkle says of the testimonies that they open the heart by challenging the conduct, conduct and conscience of others, sometimes in alarming ways. For friends, testimonies are ways we speak and act our faith in the world. These collective testimonies are not in any way rules to live by. They are an invitation to understand these fruits of the collective spirit of friends in one's own heart, to know them inwardly and from that source to shift how one acts in the world. It is not easy. Early friends were persecuted often for enacting the testimonies, for acting in the spirit of what they knew inwardly. A way that testimonies are woven into the fabric of our worship life is through advices and queries. New England Yearly Meetings Book of Faith and Practice has an excellent description of advices and queries. Faith and practice books are collectively gathered wisdom that our Quaker yearly meetings write together to serve as a guide for, or discipline for practicing our faith. They are regularly revised to reflect the current understanding or wisdom and practice of the group, which changes as deeper levels of truth are uncovered being, via continuing revelation within that particular body of friends. New Ye England yearly meeting friends say, Advices convey the wisdom gained from the inward experiences of friends trying to live faithfully in the light. 
They may reassure us, counsel us, or challenge us. Queries are tools directing us toward the source of guidance as we reflect on our current condition as individuals or as meetings. They elicit responses, but not answers. The value of the queries lies in our thoughtful consideration of them, recognizing both the response that rises out of our current condition and the one that expresses our aspirations. Bringing these two responses together is a continuing challenge as we strive to live faithfully. While we may formulate queries related to particular situations, general advices and queries can be used again and again as a spiritual tool as we grow and change. There are currently six testimonies commonly understood to be the core Quaker testimonies, simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, uh, and stewardship or sustainability. Paul Buckley says about the process of naming these, you can go back to the 1940s and Howard Brinton wrote a Pendle Hill pamphlet in which he talked about what Quakerism is. And one of the things that he put there was a statement about social testimonies. People began talking about these social testimonies more and more as being characteristics of being a friend. By the 1990s, somewhere I think probably in the mid 1990s, this particular acronym catches on. Research that I've done and that other people have done seems to indicate that early in the use of spices, it was for children. Spices became an easy way of telling children some Quaker values in a format that made it easy to remember. And it's catchy. It really is catchy. It's a great way to introduce these things to kids and people realized, well, that's a pretty good way of answering the question from the newcomer on Sunday morning who says, what do Quakers believe? Well, trot out the spices. Well, we believe in peace and integrity and well, simplicity. You don't wanna forget that one. That's what he said, Paul says. But the codification of the testimonies can result in friends using them like they are a creed, a repeated statement about what we believe. But friends don't have creeds. When your faith is based on an inward knowing of the spirit, over-reliance on what has already been said or on writings and statements that can feel or sound doctrinal misses the core practice of friends, to seek and to know the spirit for oneself. Certainly there are truths we have come to understand collectively and testimonies are one way that this is expressed. And it's critically important that we always return to the source, our inward knowing, that we are always testing the truth with our own hearts and deeper understanding. So with that in mind, let's talk about each one. Integrity. Many friends understand integrity to be the core Quaker testimony, that we are called to act in alignment with our inner understanding of the spirit in our daily lives. Many understand that this is the root of all our other testimonies. If we live with integrity, the other testimonies arise from that striving to be in alignment with an inner sense and inner knowing. I remember the clerk of the first meeting I was a member of, Carol Gilbert, talking about trying to be the same person in all the spaces she inhabited, not one way at work and another at home, but striving to live an integrous life, one in which she was acting with consistency and clarity and not wobbling from her core, her sense of her center. When my son was very young, I think he was three, he was sitting on the kitchen floor trying to make a decision. I don't remember what it was. I said to him, that must be challenging. Your teachers think one thing, your friends another, your dad and I think something else, and then you also have your own inner sense. Simon, what do you think is the most important? He said, without hesitating, my own inner sense. Living with integrity is cutting through the noise of what others think, what others might do to find the inner kernel of truth from which you will live. Collective integrous living is found in living from the collective sense of inner sensing of the spirit, finding that truth together, then acting from it. Early friends lived integrity in several ways. They would not swear oaths to the King of England and could be imprisoned for it. They would not swear oaths because as friends of the truth, they felt that there should not be a special occasion for truth telling as swearing oaths implied, but then one's word should be consistently true, that when you spoke, you uttered the truth, that others could rely on that truth, whether you were promising to take an action or speaking from what you understood, that you would share what friends refer to as the measure of light or truth 
that you have at any particular moment. This means speaking the truth of your inward experiencing and speaking of your inward experience and speaking the truth of what you seen or witnessed. Early friends would not swear oaths to the king as well because their allegiance was to the inward spirit, not to any outward authority. Quaker merchants also charged one price for what they sold, which was considered honest dealing at the time, not to charge some more if you could get them to pay more. Many Quaker merchants did very well with such an approach as customers would choose them over other merchants. Today, this might be replaced with pay as lead approaches or sliding scales, acknowledging that those who pay for a good or service may have differential ability to pay. Such practices work best when offered transparently with a sense of what is being paid for or costs associated, but are practiced regularly among friends. For me, integrity means living truth. It takes great attentiveness and discipline to do so. Judith Atchison, a Quaker author said, I have long believed that speaking truth is both the simplest way of leading your life and one of the most difficult to achieve. It is one thing to feel a thing or experiencing an insight and another to live from it. To walk in faith and integrity is a central calling of friends with an understanding that the more we live from the light and truth as we understand it, more will be offered to us. My experience is that we only walk in integrity moment by moment, breath by breath, listening to our inner guide individually and rooted in community. One example of living in integrity is John Wilman's story about being asked to write a will for a neighbor who asked him to include giving the young person he enslaved to one of his children. He wrote in his journal in 1756, a neighbor desired me to write his will. I took note. And amongst other things, he told me uh, to which of his children he gave his enslaved young person. I considered the pain and distress he was in and knew not how it would end. So I wrote his will, save only the part concerning the person he enslaved and carrying it to his bedside, read it to him and then told him that I could not write any instruments by which my fellow creatures were made slaves without bringing trouble to my own mind. I let him know that I charged nothing for what I had done and desired to be excused from doing the other part in the way he proposed. Then we had a serious conference on the subject and at length, he agreeing to set her free, I finished his will. Living in integrity is a way to bring forth the world we hope can be. It is one way to disrupt, disrupt the cultural norms that oppress. Acting in one's own integrity, in one's own sense of right action, as John Woolman did in this case, is a way to inspire changed actions in another, as it did in, this, in the case of this person for whom he wrote the will. And acting in integrity is its own important way of being, to live a life that is a deep expression of your own understanding of truth and what God and the Spirit is asking of you. Peace. The peace testimony is a central commitment of all friends. It and Quaker business practice are often considered to bind all friends across our great theological differences. It is a central commitment of Quakers. The peace testimony arise initially as a personal act of conscience by George Fox. Fox was in prison for a charge of blasphemy. He was known within prison for his honesty and commitment to justice. At the time, Puritans wanted to establish a godly commonwealth and soldiers and army commissioners came to Fox and offered him release from prison if he would accept a role in Cromwell's army. George Fox said about this, I told them I lived in the virtue of that life and power that took away the occasion of all wars and I knew from whence all wars did rise. I told them that I was come into the covenant of peace, which was before wars. In 1759, there was a political crisis um, the, in the Puritan Commonwealth was at risk um, of the restoration of the monarchy and the state church, which English gentry wanted to restore. Fox was in turmoil as the monarchy was against the principles of friends and would result in their deeper persecution. But he concluded that not even this cause could justify violence. Michael Burkle says about Fox's conclusions at this time, not even saving the dream of a transformed society could justify violence, since the violence itself would demonstrate that the transformation had not been real. 
This testimony became collective when a declaration from friends was sent to King Charles II in 1660. Our principle is, and our practice have, has, have always been, to seek peace and ensue it, and to follow after righteousness and the knowledge of God, seeking the good and welfare and doing that which tends to the peace of all. The occasion of which war and war itself, wherein envious men who are lovers of themselves more than lovers of God, lust, kill, and desire to have men's lives or estates, ariseth from the lust. All bloody principles and practices we, as to our own particulars, do utterly deny, with all outward wars and strife and fightings with outward weapons, for any end or under any pretense whatsoever. And this is our testimony to the whole world. Living peace, practicing peace, is, as with, as with all testimonies, an inward and outward process. Early friends were clear that outward wars were expressions of inward turmoil. And so the process of learning peace is an essential one. For me, I have come to know experientially that serenity and peace is not a function of circumstances, that there was an inward well within me that is a source of guidance and calm. It has come to me most clearly in times of turbulence and struggle to know that if I feel what I feel, sadness or grief or anger, and give myself space to process these feelings, I will be returned through grace to a sense of ease and inward peace. It rises from being present with what is, not evading or bypassing what rises in the midst of difficulty or sorrow. I think this is what early friends were speaking of, the capacity to cultivate an inward knowing and sense of the indwelling spirit that offers a deeper sense of peace in the midst of some, sometimes deeply troubling circumstances. Worship offers a deep practice space to find that inward peace, to settle and know the spirit underneath the noise. And practicing this peace outwardly is essential, I believe, as well. Right now, for me, it means speaking up for and struggling for peace and justice in Palestine. I have been to Gaza twice, and I have friends threatened by the currently enacted genocide. With such deep repression for even speaking about the genocide or speaking out for Palestine at the moment, for me, it is both an issue of integrity and advocating for peace that I speak and act for the end of the bombing, the ethnic cleansing, the dispossession of land. One way that shows up for me is having been willing to risk arrest twice uh, in protests ad advocating for an arms embargo and divesting from Israel. In both cases, I was arrested. And for me, taking action for what I believe is, is right soothes my nervous system, is the way I stay calm and inwardly peaceful to take a stand for what I believe is right in community. The inconvenience and discomfort of being arrested seems small compared to the huge risk Palestinians are taking right now in speaking up or just trying to survive. Peace, like all of the testimonies, invite us to take risks for our faith, to live into the world we are striving to create through our witness. Community. Elemental to Quaker practice is the testimony of community. Doug Gwynn says, Community is the way we learn to live better lives, the community of the friends meeting, and that together we find the truth more adequately than we can as individuals. We practice our faith in community. It is how we more deeply discern what God is calling us to. Sometimes I think that the community of friends can be a stand in for God, that when I can't see or perceive the inward spirit, that the community of friends offers a way to find God when I cannot find it elsewhere to see it in the collective body, expressions of the divine. Our faith is practiced together, whether worship or business or discerning a leading, we do it with one another. That means walking through conflict and understanding that within our differences, we can find the divine. Equality. The testimony of equality arises from the understanding of that of God in each person. And out of that, a sense that all people are radically equal. This was first expressed within the religion by the welcome and uplift of Quaker women ministers and refusing to use forms of address 
um, that recognize social distinctions. Quakers called everybody thee when thou was widely used for people of a higher class. As time has gone on, this testimony has called friends to a deeper commitment to racial and social justice. Many friends would translate the equal quality testimony to equity in order to acknowledge how within our social structures, people are born into a system of racism and classism that puts folks on differing footing from birth, not equal. Equity acknowledges this structural injustice. The equality testimony calls friends to upend and disrupt those systems and working from the understanding and deeply held belief that each person holds truth and deserves dignity. Simplicity. Simplicity is also an inward and outward testimony. It calls us to focus on what is most essential, to let fall away distractions and things that are not elemental to our life, whether that is clutter or material objects we don't need or busyness or focusing on that which keeps one from manifesting purpose and one, un one's understanding of God's direction for your life. Stewardship. Stewardship is about environmental care, but it is also about stewarding all resources, include, including time, money, and talent well. Caring for the earth and oneself, tending well that which has been offered to your care. The justice, a justice testimony. For years, friends have been talking about adding another testimony, a justice testimony which invite, would invite friends to grapple with the understanding that peace is only possible when justice is also realized. And that in order for us to manifest this full, full spiritual vision of friends, justice would be a pathway toward the deepest manifestation of that vision. Testimonies offer friends a compass for living our faith in the world, but the magnetal, magnetic needle that orients us on that compass is our inward spiritual life. Living faith is a personal and collective act. And as we join our souls together in faithful action, we create a possibility for a different reality based on the deeper understanding of God's invitation to a faithful individual and collective life. May we continue to walk in faith toward the spiritual reality promised in practicing Quaker faith.